Welcome, everybody, to the Union Federation podcast here on the Fandom Podcast Network and the BQN Network. We got a big episode today. We are discussing the season and series finale of Star Trek Discovery Life itself. Now, a lot of people might say we don't have much life around here on this podcast, but I beg to differ and I can prove it because I have got an extra packed crew on the Union Federation Starship this week. But first and foremost, I got to bring in our top notch security officer the co-founder of the Fandom Podcast Network, and he's been known to do some things with Breen that I don't want to talk about, Mr. <laughs> Kevin Reitzel. <laughs> What's up? Glad to be here, and I'm really happy about uh, the uh, the crew that we have today. we got a lot to talk about. Really excited. Uh, speaking of the crew, um, we need because we have an expanded crew, we needed proper refreshments. I needed some Romulan ale. Um, so I have taken uh, Miss Amy Nelson off of her holographic captain duties and back to her smuggler days from early on in the Union Federation. So let me bring in the wonderful Miss Amy Nelson. Amy, you have plenty of Romulan ale for us, even though it might be illegal even in the future. Yes, um, I would prefer courier instead of smuggler. Just saying, you know, I want to be working with book. You know, she could out drink Scotty any day. I, I just know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, we do still need to have some education on this. And I, we've got a great science officer, but I really think what she wants to do is shoot torpedoes into a nebula and just cause massive destruction. I, I think that's kind of her mood these days. Of course, it's the amazing Haley Sauter. Hello. Yeah, I'm I'm totally ready to uh, make that nebula go boom. So, and I'm not going to lie, I might throw something in that black hole. Just saying. <laughs> no, please, oh. please not be me. Please not be me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying who or what, but uh, yeah, it, there might be something. Now, um, Haley, I'm going to hold you responsible for what's about to happen. Fair. I, I, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> um, we're, we're in being invaded by a couple of Trek geeks. Uh, of course, the one and only Bill Smith and Mr. Reading's Dan all? Davidson. <laughs> chug in the Romulan ale. Oh, Amy, sorry. Chug. I warned you about Chug, this Dan, guys. chug. <laughs> it's hard to chug with a cap on. Hey everybody! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you saw that, did you? So Haley, uh, who do we who do we have here for the listeners too? Who we got? Uh, yeah. So uh, these wonderful gentlemen, I got to meet them years ago. Anyway, uh, it's Bill Smith and Dan Davidson from the Trek Geeks Network. They are dear friends of mine and Amy's, all of ours, really, mm -hmm. um, and truly wonderful podcast people. Um, they've created something. I think that Amy's trying to strive to with the BQN. <laughs> as far as podcast <laughs> networks go. So, yeah. Wait, wait, welcome, Haley. Bill. Welcome, wait. Dan. Yeah. It is welcome, great guys. To be here. Haley. So Wonderful excited. Gentlemen, are we sure they're on the right podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think they're ever really sure where they are. Yes. That's a good point at this age. <laughs> what time is yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Who was the right one? In Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> Oba Fett, where? Yeah. Huh? So, we are going to be talking about the finale season finale and series finale life itself this week of course it has been the final adventure of star trek discovery and of course you're listening to this on the fandom podcast network podcast feed or if you're think lucky enough you're watching it on our youtube channel or maybe you're listening to it on the bqn as well because amy's just assimilating the internet and it's really kind of getting scary a lot of green lots of green it's it, 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 it's a thing but but we are going to be talking about this amazing crew, their final adventure, at least for now, on uh, Paramount Plus and for the end of Star Trek Discovery and the adventures of Michael Burnham, as some people will call that show. <laughs> um, we have hit the season finale and we got a lot to talk about. So first and foremost, spoiler warnings. We are going to be diving deep into this finale of Star Trek Discovery. So... If you have not yet watched this finale of Star Trek Discovery, go watch it, come back, rejoin us. Um, it's a little extra long this week, guys. We got almost an hour and a half episode this week. So we got, we, we got an extra dose of Trek this week, which is always a beautiful thing. But we're going to get things started because we got a lot of people here, a lot of crew, and a lot of things to talk about. So let's warp into our first topic. which of course is the 
Admiral's Log episode synopsis. Miss Nelson, would you care to enlighten us on what happens on this episode of Star Trek Discovery? Why, definitely. The portal takes Burnham and Maul to a higher dimension structure where Burnham convinces Maul to work together, finally. Buck and Culber hold the portal with the shuttle's tractor beam using knowledge that Culber inherited from Janal, and Saru convinces Tahal, Primark Tahal, to stay away, though she sends a scout ship to investigate. Burnham accesses the technology and connects with the consciousness of a progenitor who explains that she is free to use the technology, but it cannot bring Locke back to life. Burnham leaves with Maul as the Discovery crew use their unique spore-based propulsion system to send the Breen Dreadnought and to Hall's scout ship to the edge of the galaxy. Burnham decides that no one should control the progenitor's technology and releases the portal into one of the black holes. Weeks later, the crew attends Saru and Tarina's wedding, where Burnham and Book affirm their love for one another and accept a new mission Aww. from Kovic, who reveals himself to be the time-traveling operative, Agent Daniels. He also plans to offer Maul a job. Years later... Burnham and Book have a son, Leto, who is now a Starfleet captain. Burnham, uh, now an admiral, takes Discovery, which is restored to its 23rd century appearance, to a specific location where its sentient computer, Zora, will wait for a long time as part of a new Red Directive mission. So a lot happens in this episode, guys, but right now I would like to get some first impressions of this episode, and I'm going to be nice to our guest. Bill, why don't you kick things off for us and tell, give us your thoughts on this finale, general finale and your first reactions to it. I'm going to use a word I've used many times on Trek Geeks during one of our See It or Skip It episodes, and that word is this, meh. I would really kind of lukewarm on this finale in the scope of, of what it does for the season. I, I really am not impressed. Um, it's an average episode of star Trek. Um, and I don't think it necessarily, um, does a, a decent job of, of anything it attempts to do. It's just sort of there. Okay. Well, let's, let's see the other side of our Trek geek duo. Dan, what did you think of the, yeah, I um I also don't think it was the greatest of, of finales. I, I I rate it like this, and this is what I talked about this weekend at Trek Long Island. When I watch the finale of Deep Space Nine, even so many years later, whenever that finale is on, I weep like a baby every single time without without question. When I watch all good things, I get teared up. That poker scene when the when the when the camera's spinning away. Don't make me cry, tear, man. Tear up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have an intake of breath with this finale, even when they brought the bridge crew back um, in the epilogue. Um, it was a good story. If it wasn't for Rainer, I don't know if I would have any love for the episode at all. It was a good send off for discovery, but it was a lackluster finale in my opinion. Interesting. Amy, where do you fall on this? Wow. Okay. So I'm going to judge discovery. <laughs> with against itself because yes it is no all good things it's it just isn't um it's better than these are the voyages right um for a finale but for discovery this is a great finale there were i mean previous seasons i would say discovery is meh as well but this season and this final episode, I felt wrapped it up very well. The themes and what we got to see at, throughout the whole season, which I still am so surprised that they didn't know this was the last season because of so many callbacks and the connection with the chase and TNG and everything. Like it was to me, I feel the best season and this episode wrapped it up so well. Uh, I, did cry at the very end when Burnham said, let's fly. And I saw her eyes and it's not really for the show. And I think maybe you guys will agree. Like I got the 
so sad feeling that I'm not going to see these actors again because I'm in love with the actors. That's what saving discovery for me is because we know the actors so well when they came out STLV saw them on the cruise. Like they've been with us this entire time. And I love the actors so much. And then just to feel like I am never going to see this crew again, these actors all together. That's when the tears started to flow. Mr. Reitzel. Uh, I'm, Kind of feeling what our uh, uh, Trek Geek guys are saying a little bit. <clears throat> so remember when we were watching the episode of TNG that this uh, this whole season is based on uh, the chase and everyone finally gets there. And then we have, you know, the I guess what we now know is one of the progenitors there and played by the lovely as it Salome Jens. Is that who played if I remember correctly? Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Um, and uh you know, you felt that the the TNG representation uh, or the Enterprise representation was really excited about what was going on, but then you kind of and I'm paraphrasing, but remember when the Klingons and the Romulans they were just like, whatever, we're out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, that's kind of how I felt when it came to. Um, now I'm just talking about the story because we've all we've always had issues with them wrapping up the story at the end of these Discovery seasons. I will go on record saying this is the best season of Discovery. I'm not the biggest fan of Discovery, but the, what I do like about Discovery is the character moments throughout the seasons. And that's what has made me continue to watch Discovery, not just because it's Star Trek, but because there's certain moments that I like. But they never really stick to landing, and we've had issues with that. And I kind of felt that way when it came to the whole progenitor thing. Uh, I'm just like, okay, they found it. Yay. And okay. Now what? Okay. Shoot it in a black hole, whatever. But then I'm glad that we had like an extra, like half an hour of character development of mm -hmm. what we see next of characters, which is what I found a lot more entertaining than anything with the whole season long progenitor thing. So that started out well because it tickled that, um, that tickled that, uh, TNG love because they took the reference to that. And I thought that was a smart move. Uh, I thought Rainer was probably the best new character of the season. I love the moments with him, especially him getting to know the crew. And I liked what we saw from him from this episode. Uh, but when it comes to the story itself, it fell flat for me. Ailey? Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I think where it excelled in this episode is tying up the loose ends, those threads, rather than still leaving you wondering at the end, like what's going to happen. Uh, they, they touched on this at some point in the season and we didn't get an answer to it. Um, they touched on something that I, I mean, I wasn't pondering who Kovic was like, I didn't, it was just another character I figured. And so they touched on something that I wasn't even expecting. And that was wonderful. So I think overall, probably this is the best season ender for a discovery season in comparison to the others. Um, it probably doesn't rate super high with me as far as season, like series finales, but I think it was really well done. I think it was handled really well. I did get a little emotional like towards the end, like Amy was saying, because you know, you play these characters for so long and I think it was more of an emotional tie for them to say goodbye to something. Some of these characters are going to go on and continue on in other series, but you know, there's this degree of a lot of them, they're done and, and that's sad. Um, so I can only imagine, you know, working on a project for so long and there's that, oh, I'm so glad I'm done with it, but also like, I'm really sad to not be doing this anymore. Um, even though they'll continue and probably still get together and, and spend time with each other just because they've become a family. Um, that aspect of this is ended for them. Um, but I think they did a really, really decent job of tying everything up. And I think maybe why it might seem like for some people that, oh, okay, they, they tied it up and they wrapped the story up maybe a little too fast with the progenitors and their technology. I think tying in something to Dr. Culber and Stamets, we don't always have to have all the answers. Sometimes it's okay if a question is still out there and that's just where it is because we're not ready for the answer yet. I'll say, I think all great points everybody had uh, for me, I am kind of in the middle. I think Amy has a great point when you compare it to previous discovery finales, 
I think this is by far the best finale Discovery has had. Um, for me also personally, though, I think this was the most consistent season of Discovery, which helped in that aspect. I would have liked to have seen things go out on a, uh, a different note, but I also take into consideration they filmed this initially thinking they were probably going to have at least one more season. So I, I, I'm trying to take that into consideration as well. Is it the best episode of Star Trek? No. Is it for what Discovery is? It fits. And I think that's the big thing for me is that that's how that works works there. And we're going to get into some of the more of those points a little bit later. But guys, right now, I'm going to warp us out because we got to talk a little Star Trek trivia. And we are going to have some fun with Star Trek trivia because we're going to talk about things we saw in a certain um, – office that was kind of impressive i think we'd all like to have a little bit of this collection so we're gonna start off with this um somehow dr kovich has managed to get a bottle of chateau picard on one of his shelves of course a nod to the family business of admiral jean-luc picard interestingly enough the vintage on kovich's bottle of chateau picard is 2249 the year that giorgio and burnham first met so, oh. He's never going to open that thing. That cork's going to be so dry; it's stored wrong. It's, yeah. it's vinegar already. <laughs> it's vinegar. Yes, right now. vinegar. Thank <laughs> you. Is, is, is COVID? Is COVID, is COVID? Is he showing off? Or Daniels? Is he showing off? Come on, totally. Uh, off, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Come on, yep, hundred percent. You're, you're showing off with item number two. Two. Here. Oh God, that yes. hit me. Right, yeah. Haley. Oh. I so thought of you when I saw this I'm instantly. <sighs> Did okay. he steal it off of Jordy? I mean, how does he wind up with this? Well, Jordy well, had to pitch it away once he got his implant. So he just probably yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. I mean, I mean, no, I'm sure I mean, he had one. Like Jordy had Jordy, a bunch. Of- would have kept it. I feel like there was some Berlinghoff Rasmussen shenanigans going on here. I'm <laughs> yeah. just saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, you well, like, I have. I have multiple pairs of contacts, so I'm sure he has multiple <laughs> visors. Oh, no, you watch shenanigans. I think the most passed off item in Star Trek history might be this. <laughs> yeah, that ba- okay, yes. first of all, that baseball is way too new to be the one that Cisco always had. It Thank you. Yeah. Dirt. <laughs> yeah. It's not it's signed. also it's not the autograph one from Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite either. Yeah. Yeah. Why was there no autograph? So he just went to Fenway Park one day, grabbed the baseball out of <laughs> yeah. the Rawlings bin, and that's that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sentiment all, all i know is that baseball right. has got gotten around it has it, this is interesting too he has a dagger from the terran he has a terran dagger oh. uh, yep. has been fascinated with the mirror universe since he was a boy so yes there is a dagger hanging on his wall from the mirror universe please let it be evil uhura that'd be great <laughs> oh, be <laughs> and there's a nice call with the with the rabbit because Alice in Wonderland's been a thing. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yep. That, that, that is a good point. But the, I think the most fun one, and I think the one we might all steal, is the fact that he has the Dustbuster Phaser. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 yep. <laughs> well, we need to vacuum I mean, your well, keyboard made of programmable matter. You want a Dustbuster. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, th- I think he might have, like... Wh- Went into like Kibas Faggio's place after it was all confiscated, you know. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So, so I, I got to ask you guys: if you were Kovic and could time travel and had access to all of this, what one Star Trek item would you have on your shelf? What Oregon. item do I have on my <laughs> shelf? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. give me that Horagon, baby. What, 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 that's what, what, I want. what would you have on your shelf, Amy? <laughs> Um, well, I do have my TNG phaser and tricorder, so I that's yeah. Dan, what you grabbing? I have Odo's bucket. There you oh, go. This is, from yes. the X, this is from the X06 model, but I would have I would grab Odo's bucket. Absolutely. That's a good call. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Bill, mm-hmm. I would have vacuum sealed pieces of desiccated quark. Fifty two <laughs> dish. <laughs> <laughs> Vacuum desiccated quark, no more. Oh. <laughs> oh, Haley? Haley, if I could have one thing and it wouldn't be on a shelf, but it'd be in the corner of the room, I'd have that damn poker table. Mm. Oh, nice. that's yeah. a Amy, good one. Amy would probably like the driving instructions for the navigation of the Enterprise <laughs> D. So probably would not have to crash it. <laughs> okay, okay, Mr. Oh, Wright, that's a good one. <laughs> 
Kyle? What, what would you have, Kevin? I want the horror gun. That's what I want. I want the horror gun. Nice. Yeah. I, I just I just want to know why he doesn't have a box of Kelpie and Helper up on his. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, guys, let's transfer. Kyle, what would in. you have? I, I, well, let's, that, that's a tough one for me. Um, you should have been thinking about that when we were all doing I don't it. Know. <laughs> I, 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 it. Would it be inappropriate to say Nurse Chapel? <laughs> <laughs> which one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, which one? Yeah. Strange New Worlds. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew that answer. <laughs> on a, on a I mean, if we're going people, hello. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, the ladies are gonna have you want one fight. date with her because she might kick your ass. Her <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's that, that's true too. Can, can, can I just have my own hollow deck? There you go. That's yeah. fair. Pretty good. Yeah, I like that. That would be a good one. Yeah. That would be a good one. I don't know if I'd want the Reginald Barkley programs. I wouldn't get the holodex off Deep Space Nine because I don't know how Cork takes care of those. So <laughs> well, and Dan can clean the biofilters. So yeah. Mm. Again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Nope. Okay, well. guys. It's time to transport into our first away mission. Okay, guys. Away mission number one. We are going to kind of I want to dive a little deeper into the aspect of the of the season finale because again we talked about it a little earlier. The season finales of Discovery have been kind of hit or miss or up and down. So I want to talk about this this particular finale itself, just on how it stands alone in its own merit of being the finale just for this season, because a lot happens. There's a lot of choices made. I want we'll, we'll hit some of the. Points of those, you know, choices Burnham made with the progenitor technology, things that happen with Culver, even choices Saru makes, and Saru has maybe one of the best badass moments of Discovery in the entire run in this episode. I am going to say that. But um, Kevin, I'm actually going to go here with you first and kind of give me what your thoughts are as this being a season fin- itself, just the season finale for this season. Well, I've, I've said before that I have not gone back and rewatched any discovery uh, except for maybe one or two episodes for reference for podcasting, basically. So I, I know there's, we've said that it's the season finale of most of discovery has fallen flat, but what really hit for me though, was that I did, there were certain character moments in this that I felt really did hit the mark. I love seeing, uh, finally, you know, book in, and uh, um, Burn, Burnham get together, you know, and I had made a comment a few episodes ago that I miss like I, I miss romance and Star Trek. You know, we had some good arcs through several of the main previous series from the eighties and the nineties. Um, and I felt that we got some nice moments between book and Burnham here, especially seeing them end up together, having a son. That was kind of nice. Um, but I did miss seeing some of the other characters that have just become afterthoughts of the crew of discovery, which we've talked about in the past. It was nice to see Saru get married. I love those moments with Trina, uh, Trina, Trina, um, Trina, Trina. Um, that was nice because it kind of basically gave a reason to have a reunion with the current members of discovery. Uh, but I would have liked to have seen a little call out to that. Uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, the Kovic being Daniel's thing, um, okay, it makes sense. He's a weird guy that knows too much stuff and doesn't talk much. I get it. Uh, I always kind of wondered about the Daniels character. That was one of my favorite characters in uh, Enterprise. I love Enterprise. Yeah, so gonna, it was nice to talk about Daniels before. Yeah. Um, so I liked I liked that. But uh, you know, for me overall, it was uh, character development wise, it was adequate. It, it it had a couple of moments, but for the overall story arc, it uh, burned for me. <laughs> Amy, I mean, we have progenitor tech. We've got the Breen. We've got so many moving pieces pieces here what did you think as far as did the, did the finale accomplish it what it needed to and what were, i mean do you think how they handled certain aspects and how they wrap things up yeah i again i think it did wrap up things very very lovely and sort of going through your pictures that you've got here um there were some things that just sort of fell flat i, I guess meh i didn't hate it but i felt like it was a shortcut or they just wrote it that way. Cause the story, like we still don't know what the progenitors technology is. 
We don't know how they seeded. We know that there's different worlds that was already there when they found it. And somehow they just went and seeded the worlds. We have no idea how they do it. Um, so that was just a little too convenient to just push under the rug and then burn them. Of course, the right choice was, yes, we have infinite diversity. We're good. We're going to trust that we can continue to grow together and be productive. Like that was huge Star Trek philosophy, totally in line and in love with that. Um, and I really liked Maul and Burnham's push tug of war between, are you going to trust me? Am I going to trust you? And I felt like Burnham, again, this is the idealistic, how do we deal with haters? And it finally came down to Maul keeps saying, I don't trust you. I don't trust the Breen. I only trust me and my actions and my love for Locke. Well, Burnham is like, finally gets it through her head where it's like, yeah, don't trust the Federation. Trust me. And that's when they were able to then work together and, and get out. So I think that if we can, as a society, like figure out how to deal with haters and get it down to trust me, I will take care of you in this world I am I going to allow myself to trust you who's in opposition? Like that was a very interesting dynamic. Now, the things that I thought were just met, like there's no way that this progenitor's uh, technology couldn't bring Locke back. That just was a line written just so that we didn't have to worry about that. It, because there's too many things previously in Star Trek that we brought people back. I mean, look at discovery. Like, so that I didn't like that story writing with Colbert going to help a uh, book. That was just a little convenient. Oh, I have these memories from Jan Janal. Uh, it just was too convenient. It, I, I didn't believe it, I guess. And I know it's, I just wasn't a big fan of the major fight scenes between Maul and Burnham. It was cool and like Matrix with them jumping off the walls and landing on the ceilings and, you know, jumping around, going through all the stuff. I, for me, I got bored with the, I was just like, okay, yes, we know that they're fighting. Let's move on. Um, and then with opposite, with the Tarina and Saru, I needed more. I felt like the lighting, with it being backlit, I couldn't really see their faces. I couldn't see the connection that normally when Saru and Tarina are talking to each other, we see their emotions, their facial expressions, like how they're holding themselves with each other. Like I needed to see more of that, of that wedding and their love for each other to get a more conclusion for me. And what about you? As far as the finale goes, a little bit more of the finer points of it. What, what stood out? What were the yeah. moments? And what, uh, what, uh. One of the things, that, a few of the things that I'll talk about. First of all, I talked about it a minute ago. Um, as DS9 is my favorite series of all time, I do like the fact that in the last two series that we have watched, Picard and Discovery, the series finale or the series uh, the final season has heavy DS9 interaction. You had the changings in Picard season three, which I absolutely loved. You've got the Breen in, in the final season of Discovery. I said, actually, I think it was here when I was a guest on your show a few weeks ago that I was a little disappointed that they demasked the Breen because it took that terror aspect out of them. They were scary in Deep Space Nine. They never took their mask off. Nobody knew what was there. They took the mask off. It kind of took away some of that terror. But I will say throughout the rest of the season, they built that back up with how formidable they are and how huge their ships are and how they'll stop at nothing to get what they want. I thought that was great. Um, this is tongue in cheek when I say this, but I've said it a couple of times. This season had a lot going on. The progenitors chasing all over the galaxy to find this piece of technology, people going into extra dimensions, fight scenes, people dying, all kinds of weird things, people taking over other people's bodies. And at the end, she throws it away. She throws it away. <laughs> I understand why, but I'm like, girl, you just threw it away. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Um, 
I love the Kovic reveal. It was unexpected. I think Haley mentioned that earlier. Uh, Haley or Amy mentioned that. That was a surprise. I know that I never thought it was anybody but this guy named Kovic who just was part of Section 31. But I talked to people in Long Island this weekend who have been talking about most of the series, how it was somebody else. And a lot of people thought it would be Gary Seven, which I thought would have been incredible. Um, but I got to say, I loved the Daniels reveal. And I thought that that was a good aspect of it. Um, Discovery does a great job at relationships and uh, family has been a huge part of the entire series. And I did like that. There were aspects of it that I thought slowed things down at the wrong time. I thought it was very inappropriate for Burnham to start talking to book about feelings and everything in the middle of a fight on a Breen dreadnought ship. I understand the reason that they did it, but I'm just like, you couldn't have done that like 20 minutes before you beamed over to the ship girl. Um, so all in all good points, bad points. Was it the best? Everybody's been talking about this today. Was it the best finale of a season of discovery? I'm not really sure if I'd say yes to that um, because some of the season uh, finales were pretty good. Season two was season one when the enterprise warped in in front of them was just like an, a holy bleep moment for me. Um, but all in all good and bad. Um, uh, happy and sad. Take it or leave it. <laughs> Bill, what about you? What, what, give us some of your finer points on this finale. You know, I feel like I have to preface it this way and say, I really am a fan of Star Trek Discovery. Mm -hmm. I have been since day one. I think that Discovery does some things incredibly well, like character building, like, like many of you have said so far. But, you know, a couple of years ago, I wrote a column for treknews.net called The Problem with Discovery. And my thesis was that they rely too much on crisis. You know, it, it, invariably you get crisis fatigue when you watch Discovery because everything is humanity at risk. Everything is the galaxy at risk. Everything is carbon-based life at risk. Um, every, and following the mystery box format. So what do they do this year? They say, well, you know, we're, we're going to make it not everything's at risk. And so instead of doing that, they gave us an entire season about a mysterious box instead of following the mystery box format. Um, and then once we get the box together, we find out all life potentially in the universe could be at risk. Um, I, I feel like the finale did a couple of things very well. The interpersonal relationships are always there. You know, there's, there's really good character growth, usually. And even in the first hour, you know, if you leave off the epilogues for a second, the first hour, you know, where they resolved the conflict and, you know, um, Burnham threw it away, as Dan says. I, I thought that the interpersonal relationships worked very well, with the exception of that scene on the brain worship. The thing that Discovery doesn't do well is that everything is so mammoth. I think one of the worst things to happen, and, and this is this finale had it, you know, on steroids, was that AR wall. Um, nothing is intimate anymore. And in TOS, everything had to be confined in a set on a room or on a soundstage that looked like a, a big planet with purple skies. Um, now you can have the entire universe, vast as it is, as your backdrop, and it looks amazing. And it, it allows them to do some things they've never done before, but it's too big. This whole matrix style fight between Maul and Burnham was, it, it was different, but I was not engaged by it at all because it was just, it was like enough already. Um, I, as far as finales go for discovery seasons, um, I, I have to agree with Dan. I still think that season one is the best finale. Um, I think five is probably one of the worst in my opinion. And I'm going to say the unpopular thing and that uh, life itself is not better than these are the voyages. Um, I think that it is worse than these are the voyages, which is a great Star Trek episode. It's just not a decent finale for a series. So, Haley? <sighs> okay, so uh, for one, uh, I'm super excited that as I was watching this episode, uh, I was correct again. <laughs> <laughs> me being the oracle i have no insider news but dang if i call it um i was super excited i think uh like everybody else i'm not crazy about the fight scene um 
I don't like topsy turvy twisty stuff anyway. Um, because of my vertigo, it just really kind of messes with me, even though it's not me doing it. Um, and so that wasn't necessary, but I can see why they did it because again, it's showing that this lab, which was really interesting, it was like the space that echoes, but it's above a planet, but it, anyway, it's encased in like that part of it was like really kind of techie cool in my perspective. Um, so I thought that was really neat um, that this lab is inside this portal. And anyway, it's crazy. I know. Um, so I think just to showcase that, this idea that they had that there was this elongated room with like all these other possibilities, um, which is kind of Alice in Wonderlandy if you think about it. And again, we've had Alice in Wonderland references and discovery before. This idea of here's a space, but you can fall into another space and be in another space. And from that space, you might be able to fall back into a different space. Um, that is is really kind of interesting as far as you know how this technology was derived uh i i agree with amy in that like okay how does it work uh as stamets at the end of the episode he's like wait we need to study it we need to learn about it and that part of my brain is like yes let's like learn how this exactly works how did they take this technology that they stumbled upon and how did they learn about it and be able to use it to create life throughout the universe and throughout this galaxy that is really interesting but then i have to go back to what Kober says with book in the ship and he says maybe the answers i don't need to know i don't have to have all my questions answered and that's really hard for us as a species we like to get answers to our questions we like to understand i more so uh, just because that's how i am i'm very intrigued by things and i want to find out more but sometimes we don't necessarily need the answers because we're not ready for them. And if we had the answer, it could be detrimental to something for ourselves. It could be detrimental for others. So uh, I, I have to call back to that. Uh, I think with, you know, Burnham saying, you know, no one person should have this technology. No one person should be in control of it. I think what she did is, is admirable and correct because, yeah, that technology was there. And the progenitors, as Discovery called them, use that technology to, to help further life. But if we further life throughout the entire universe, why do we need to have something that still can continue to like further life? There is nothing else to expand upon. And I think the journey in expanding is really coming to an understanding and pulling everyone together, you know, eventually pulling in the brain and pulling in people that we're in conflict with so that we're not in conflict with them. And I think that's ultimately the journey. And so I think what she did is correct. I think throwing that in to the black hole and letting it be destroyed was the right thing to do. Who knows what the person who initially created the lab wanted it to be used for beyond what the progenitors used it for. So I think, you know, this journey that they went on to find it was to help them understand we don't need stuff like that. We don't need technology that can create or destroy life because we already have so much that's doing that anyway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still at conflict and war with other races and we still have all these weapons that we're using to kill each other. Why do we need something that could wipe us all out? Um, so that's kind of my, my take on that. Um, I loved the end when Burnham and, and book did decide, you know, like I love you and I have, and I'm sorry. I was in my own way of being able to say that to you, especially on Burnham's side of that story. And so I think that was truly wonderful. I loved the coda. I do have to say, I liked it. I think it was well done and well added. Granted, they could have left the episode with Burnham and book going off to see Kovich and, and determining what it is that he needed them to do. Um, they could have left it at that and I would have been okay with that too. But that coda was just kind of a nice little touch. And I think that was a wonderful way for them to allow the actors to kind of say goodbye to these characters that they've played for so long, knowing that so many of them probably will not continue to care, be these characters anymore. Um, badass action Saru. I think that was 
absolutely wonderful. Him saying, like, look in my eyes and you tell me, am I bluffing essentially? And I think that was fantastic. Um, that whole interaction with, um, with this other Breen character, the, you know, we don't see anything other than her big giant head <laughs> inside the ship. It's like Bill. <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> um, you mean like from third rock from the sun the big giant head? <laughs> yeah, yes <laughs> yes and the big you know like the booming voice i, I like work from mindy when work in mindy when he <laughs> talks and the voice is just there in the space um i think that was just wonderful you know he really gets to show that you know i am here i know what i'm doing and even if he was bluffing like you didn't know and I think it was wonderful. I think those two characters being together, um, being able to cloak and say, hey, we're going to still continue because we don't even believe that she's being truthful. Um, and I think that's, you know, something else, you know, being able to trust each other is a huge thing. And so I think the journey is more important than this technology that the entire season was about. So um, I'm trying to think if there was something else. Oh, I want to talk about the grappling thing because... Yeah, Amy can get on this with a little bit too because A, there's LaGrange points are kind of brought up again when they use Discovery to basically, you know, use the spore drive to get rid of the D Dreadnought class, which was really cool. But when they, when Book and Colbert go to grab this portal, which is a non-tangible thing, it is, it's not, it's there, but it's really not there. And so, of course, the tractor beam's not going to work. And even though the tractor beam is a non-tangible thing, it's matter stream. And so I love that, yes, it might seem silly that Culber's like, I have to go with you. I don't know why, but I feel like I'm going to be there for a reason. It is kind of wedged in a little bit, but the fact that he could somehow realize this is what we need to do. So creating that resonance frequency, because that's how we see things in space. We have to find their frequency at which they vibrate at. So in order for the tractor being to lock onto this non-tangible thing, so two non-tangible objects interacting with each other, you have to have them resonating at the same frequency. And I thought that part on the science part was really, mm -hmm. really awesome. Super great. Uh, if you have more questions, please let me know about this. Um, I mean, I don't fully understand it, but I do grasp it in some fashion. But then them also using discovery, which I forgot can come apart. To basically, and I love that Rainer was the one who was like, can we do this? Yeah. Can we use a spore drive to get rid of this dreadnought class that we do not have the capability of fighting? There's no way. Like, I loved that he was the one that came up with this idea. And Tilly's like, no. And then she's like, well, may maybe we could. And using the two parts of Discovery as LaGrange points to create a spot in space where they get rid of the dreadnought green ship and fling it to the edge of the galaxy was just really, really well done. And I love that idea that Rainer came up with that. Uh, Haley, I just wanted to uh, comment on something you said, uh, two things. Yeah. I like I like how you said it was more about the journey, uh, which I thought was kind of a cool comment. But when you started talking about how she basically, you know, got rid of, of this you know, MacGuffin, I'm going to call it, and threw it into a black <laughs> hole. It, it, it just kind of reminded me like, okay, they basically one ringed it into the Mount Doom. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, yeah. but, I feel, yeah. but I feel like we got a better payoff with the ring itself because we saw what it did and how it destroyed people's lives. And so that's where I felt it kind of, yeah, yes, the journey's great, but that's where I think some of us feel that she sure. didn't really get to see. And, but that's why I like that scene with Stamets, though. He's like, but wait a minute, we have to study it. And then they're like, it's and not about your legacy. And yeah, you know, but so I liked at least we had that moment because I felt like that was us talking to Discovery going, what did you just do? <laughs> or what are you about to do? You know, so anyway, I, uh, well said, by the way, well said. Thank you. Dan, I know you have something else you want to say. Yeah, I wanted to bring up one more thing. Um, and, and again, as Bill mentioned earlier, I love Discovery. It is Star Trek. I love it. I will always love it. I will watch it. With that said, whatever the reason, I don't care what the reason is. I'm glad they brought them back for the epilogue. 
I thought it was an incredible disservice to all of the actors of the bridge crew who were not seen for most of the season. I don't care if it was a scheduling conflict or what. I was really upset that we did not get to see them. We complained about it in season one. And then in season two, that moment where Pike had every officer give their name and the camera close close up on every actor I thought was great. We saw him in season three. We saw him in season four. And they were nothing but an afterthought in season five. And I thought that sucked. I also thought it was bad that we did not get to see Doug Jones nearly enough in the season. Although the scenes that he was in, as usual, he completely killed it. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. Great point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a, just a couple quick points for me. Um, it, the, as far as the progenitor thing goes, that just felt very much science fiction tropey to me from how they explained it to what they did, the decision Burnham makes that all felt like it was almost anticlimactic to me as far as that went. Um, so that was kind of what made weaken the episode for me. But again, discovery nails the character moments. Saru confronting the brain might be my favorite part of this entire season. It just, just, I, I am no, not playing poker against Saru. I love the fact that he's, I am a predator species. I'm bluffing. I, I, it was just, and I love the, I love the spring response. You are insane. <laughs> that was, it was such a great moment. Um, and it is those character moments, but, and we'll, we'll talk about this a, a little bit later, but, Kevin, you'll you'll appreciate this. Um, you brought up the one ring feeling. I was getting the end of Return of the King feeling, with, like, oh, we have this prologue, then this prologue. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, you get going and going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think it was. I think it was a great. I think it was a, a very solid. Again, it, based off the season from start to finish, this, I think this was probably the most consistent episode season of Discovery, and this finale represents that. But is it the best finale? I'm with you guys. I love that that moment of discovery in the Enterprise at the end of season one is outstanding. And I'm actually a, I'm actually a fan of the season four finale too. I think I think that was very well done. Um, I think one of the things for Discovery too, as far as its finales go, is it's a victim of what our standards are for episodes right now. Ten, when we're talking eight to ten episodes, maybe twelve for a season, mm-hmm. everything gets. Is condensed, and I still don't think the writers have fully grasped how to write around that. Yeah, and especially when you've have- been used to the whole episodic way of storytelling with most directors. So, you know? I, I think I think that's one of been one of the big key points for me with with Discovery and a lot of the shows that are currently running. But guys, I want to get on to my next point because there was a big reveal in this episode of who Kovic is, which is Agent Daniels. Now. I'm just going to say this because it's been a long time since I've watched Enterprise, so it didn't maybe hit as home for me as much as it hit for some other people. And I'm sure there's people who maybe Discovery is their first trek and they're going, who the heck is Agent Daniels? But I know I'm here with some guy, people who are encyclopedias of Star Trek. So I want to kind of get what your initial reaction was to it. And you, you was it a good idea to, to have this? Um, Dan, I'm going to start with you here. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you can uh, start with me. I actually have to drop in a couple minutes, so thank you for doing that. Um, Not a problem. I think it was fantastic that they did it. One of the things that um, – it's just a little tiny stickler point, but because this was Daniels, it would have been much more emotional and had more meaning if he said Agent Daniels NX-01 Enterprise instead of USS. It's a tiny little thing, but it means a lot to people who love Enterprise as much as people like you and I do. Um, it was a great reveal. Like I said, some people thought it was Gary Seven. I never, I, I'm stupid. I never thought anything about it being anybody but some guy named Kovic. Um, and I'm one of those people who has never seen Cronenberg in anything other than this show. I don't know if I've ever seen anything he's directed. And I know that's kind of sacrilege when it comes to science fiction stuff. Um, I love the character and I love the reveal. Since you've got to drop here in a few minutes, Dan, I want to ask you one last question. Sure. Which we'll talk about it later. Tell me what your, what is discovery's place in your Star Trek fandom? What, what is, what do you feel like its place is in, in Star Trek? This is going to sound like I don't appreciate it, but I do on so many levels. Deep space nine is the, is the series that literally saved my life, which we've talked about before. I've been a Star Trek fan since the early and uh, since the mid to late 70s. So it's been a long time for me. 
Discovery will always be what propelled Star Trek to another 60 years plus of adventures. We had stopped with Enterprise and we didn't know if we were gonna, ever going to get anything again. And then Discovery, Discovery came along and Sonequa took this franchise on her shoulders and carried it not only for the five years of the show, but for the what? 10 years of its production and it is now propelled into multiple series new movies and who knows what's going to happen going on and for that it is one of the greatest series and that it is going to continue the star trek universe for decades and decades very well said we know you you have to run dan i want to thank you for joining us so it's always great to have you on you're welcome back anytime i would love to come back thanks for having me it's great to see everybody even bill live long and prosper thanks everyone <laughs> So many shots. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, Bill, since Dan's gone now, you can be really honest. But Amy, hold on, hold on, hold on. Amy's been waving her hand. <laughs> yeah. She needs to drop in here real quick. Okay. Uh, only because it's you, Miss Nelson. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to jump in because I just have to echo everything uh, that, he's, that Dan said. Like, I've never seen Kovic before. Um, I was a little confused by not saying the NX-01 because he said USS Enterprise. And I was like, oh, is that TOS? Is that Kirk's Enterprise? It, it really confused me. But I was like, no, I know, I know uh, Daniels. He's Enterprise. So it did confuse me for a little bit. And then I was like, oh, whatever. It's just from before. So that's Agent Daniels. Um, I, again, I thought Kovic was Kovic, but then when you look back and, you know, hindsight, knowing that it is Daniels and then his interaction with Giorgio totally makes sense. Cause he's a time traveler and he's going to go and see where Giorgio ends up. I love it. So I just wanted to say, I agree with everything Dan said, and I will never say that again. <laughs> but now it's recorded for time and all eternity. Yeah. yeah. This is this is blackmail evidence I now have for you, Amy. So um, I, I'm going to text him as soon as we're done. I mean, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, we'll send him the clip. So, <laughs> so, Bill, what were your thoughts on, on Kovic being agent? I have to agree with everything that's been said so far. I, if anything, you know, I, I got a smile on my face when that happened because it's nice to have that tie back. But it instantly started me wondering, how old is Kovic? I mean, because if Daniels can literally go anywhere at any time and he's either chosen to age or he's been doing this so long that all of a sudden he's a 75 year old man, um, that's pretty fascinating. How old is Daniels? Why is he just sticking around in the 32nd century and not still jumping around? Is there a reason? So it, it made me ask more questions, which is, I think is what good Star Trek does at times, you know? Kevin, what about you? What were your thoughts on this reveal? I, you know, I, I was fine with it. It, it, uh, it cut, <laughs> I had it spoiled to me before I saw the freaking episode. Oh, oh man. I, I, yeah. I, I, you know, someone said, oh, since, uh, Kovic is Daniels and I, you know, I, there's a part of me that wanted to go nice spoiler, dude. And he, this person did it like the day after the episode came out. So I couldn't get too mad because I wanted to wait a little bit till we got closer to the podcast. I was trying to avoid a lot of stuff. So I didn't know if he was like messing around. So I, I had it spoiled to me, unfortunately, but uh, I did like the reveal, uh, especially the way the reveal was done. I thought it was really cool. Uh, and um, I, like I said, I'm a fan of enterprise. I, I, I agree with the point about, you know, saying, you know, which enterprise, the correct name of the ship. I thought that would have been kind of cool, but it wasn't a big deal for me. Uh, I just have enterprise has a special place in my heart as a series. Uh, uh, I, I wish we had gotten at least one more season with that. Uh, but Daniels was one of the cool characters, and I've always been a fan of Star Trek time travel. Uh, most of the time, it's done really, really well. And I like that Daniels was, um, you know, obviously one trying to enforce it, making sure people aren't trying to abuse it. I thought that was a great concept and just a great character. And with David Cronenberg playing um, uh, Kovic, I thought was a nice touch as well. David Cronenberg's, I know, I know who he is. I, I've been a, I, I've been aware of, of Cronenberg for a very, very long time. And mostly he's behind the camera. And for those that don't know, I did want to give a kind of a shout out to the movies that he is famous for directing. He directed the fly Videodrome, scanners, dead zone, uh, naked lunch, crash extends 
Uh, and my personal favorite, uh, History of Violence. Uh, really, really good mm. from a film. And he also did uh, Eastern Promises as well. Uh, and so as a, as a director, for me personally, he's hit or miss. But I do like his style as a director. So it was kind of refreshing to see him in front of the camera and act. But I like the fact that he was kind of weird, kind of aloof, not answering all the questions that he should be answering. And so it kind of makes sense. And I liked that reveal. I thought it was cool. And it also gives us an idea when we do a rewatch of Enterprise of what is to become of Daniels uh, because of what we thought that happened and we weren't sure that happened. So uh, I personally did enjoy the reveal. Ailey, your, your thoughts? Yeah, well, again, I it was just like, oh, well, that's that's kind of cool because I, I didn't think anything other than, okay, here's this new character that we've been introduced to. Um, it does make you go back and go, okay, well, Discovery's jumped 900 years in the future. Uh, did Daniel's already, did Kovic know that was going to happen? It, it can definitely like make you think of like, wow, how much of this stuff did he already know about? Um, especially where, you know, we get this, Red directive at the end where Burnham takes discovery to sit out and just wait, which is a call to Calypso, um, the short track, you know. And so it's like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> what does he know that's going to happen, right? Where he wants discovery to just sit out and, and wait for something, somebody, something. And so it, it's kind of interesting to think about this uh, aspect and and how much he knows. Obviously, maybe he really likes the 32nd century, and so that's why he's just hung out. Um, and perhaps he's decided that, you know, he should look more his age, I guess. Because um, I'm sure there's the ability to not look your age if he wanted to. So, you know, can't throw too many red flags around. But I thought it was kind of neat. I am. Um, can, can we have Bill touch on something here? Because Bill, you did a little face palm there when, uh, <laughs> when we were talking about uh, the Calypso connection there. I really want to get your thoughts on that. I hate it. 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 When Michael Chabon wrote Calypso, he said it wasn't supposed to be tied to the fabric of Star Trek at all. I believe that was in, in an interview with Sci-Fi Wire. Mm. Then fast forward. Chabon's working on Picard, at least the first season. And I'm guessing Alex Kurtzman decides, you know what? I really love that idea. We should jump the ship into the 32nd century to avoid problems with canon. But what do they do in the finale? They create a problem with canon. Why does the ship need to be retrofitted to its original form to go sit somewhere for a thousand years to wait for somebody in a red directive? All of a sudden, all this technology, including a spore drive, is sitting somewhere in the middle of nowhere where anyone can find it. And then, presumably, it's got weapons. It's got a warp core. What happens to Zora afterwards? Is she just going to try to go home to a Starfleet that may or may not exist now that the Vidrache are in town? Um, it, it's, it, it's a gaping mess. For the people who love Calypso, it's awesome. But you know, for something that was never intended to be part of this series permanently, um, it's it's a nightmare. Maybe it's a thing where uh, sending it forward is sending it back. Ergo, Discovery never jumped 900 years in the future. I have a thought about that. <laughs> there we go. I just, like, Bill's uh, just like, what? Well, <laughs> but Bill. <laughs> but yeah. Bill brought up something that uh, it, it's one of my biggest problems with what Discovery did is jumping 900 years in the future from a writer's angle. You're mm -hmm. right. You don't have to deal with any recent canon. And one of my biggest issues was that because it's not, it's not close enough to this world that they have built of Star Trek be because you have a couple of hundred years separating some of these stories. So then we would get callbacks in between them and such and it almost feels like they did that for that reason. So we don't have to worry about, we can make our own series. We can start and we could do a spinoff series, 900 years with new cadets and build a federation. To me, it feels like what uh, Lucasfilm did when they got rid of all the old canon of books of Star Wars and said, we got to start off and do our own. It's the Maybe job of a writer over. to write. Yeah. You know, when you put them in an environment, it doesn't matter if it's in the 22nd century 
or the 32nd century. Their job is to make it fit. And Discovery's writers in season one and season two were doing a fantastic job of making it fit. This whole idea that they had to jump to the 32nd century to avoid problems with canon is is ridiculous because you're saying the writers aren't good enough to navigate around that. Amy, you've been hang- waving your hand over there for a bit. Yeah. So one other thing that I have a problem with that goes beyond the storyline is going to the heart of who are we as a people? Is Zora sentient? Are we going to send a sentient being to sit by themselves for an undisclosed amount of time? Uh, That is torture. That is unacceptable. We would never do that to a living human being. It was punishment. It it was punishment. Yeah, you're right. It was punishment for O'Brien in an episode of DS9. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, it was. Would we even do that to data? I mean, I know time doesn't pass as well, you know, the same, but they're sentient. They're Mm -hmm. lonely. No, this is unacceptable. And when Burnham jumps with Discovery, how does she get back? Like, it's going to take her years? Like, it's going to take her years because they put her out in deep space? Anyways, but... I loved the connection to close Calypso. So I'm just going to let that go away and I'm be like, oh, that's okay. Because to me, I loved it. Calypso is my favorite short track. I love that we get the tie in. Um, but the abuse of Zora, that's a tough one that I'm just, that's the sticker. I don't, I don't care about refitting the enterprise. That's blah, 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 blah. I do because they're taking it back for it to just sit there for a thousand more years. By the time Kraft gets aboard, that ship is 2,000 year old with an AI that is probably so horrifically out of date. Um, <laughs> and that's a minor thing, but it but makes it, it's they abuse. They could have just sent the truth of it, matter is form. It, yeah. it, it could be an AI that makes Hal look tame. Right. <laughs> but they could have just sent oh, Discovery yeah. as it was to go wait a thousand years. Yeah. They didn't need to retrofit it. It was just dumb. Yeah. 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 Um, I will say that send off was really cool because it reminds me of, you know, things that they do. We do now um, when all the ships were there standing in line, essentially, as as soldiers would when someone retires. I thought that was a really, really neat way to, like, send it off as it goes out of space dock. So that aspect at least was really cool. This is a good way to transition into our final point, which is saying goodbye to Discovery. Basically, as I kind of mentioned earlier, for me, it felt like a little Return of the King. We have basically an extra half an hour of closing with the wedding of Saru and Tarina. We see what happens with Book and Burnham. Burnham has her final moments with Zora. We see some great shots of the crew together. We know that they went back and probably reshot a a lot of this after they found out the season was going to be the final season. But I, I am very curious for each of you what did you think and how they handled this? Did it hit the right emotional chord or was it kind of like, okay, we're just going to pull at your heartstrings because we can kind of feel with that. Um, I'm going to come back to you because I'm really curious to your thoughts on this. All right. Well, can we just be so excited about these beautiful uniforms? First of all, <laughs> um, I'm loving the look. Uh, Lido, wonderful tie-in uh, for his namesake, for Book's nephew. Um, and they all look so fabulous. I was getting a very much Nepenthe feel with Book and Burnham, you know, Troy Riker, you know, taking their time off. They're done. Their adventures are over. So this is them living their lives as a happy married couple So I'm all on board for that. Um, What else? Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, the wedding. Well, I said I needed more of that. I didn't feel like I got a good Saru Tarina moment. There was something with the lighting. This new age lighting doesn't do it for me. I didn't get a good look. In fact, looking at your pictures, Kyle, if you're watching us on YouTube, like the pictures are better. I can see them better than I can on 
the TV. It's just yeah. ridiculous. Look at those that's wedding That's because they lighten them up in print, I think, or I digital. Mean, it's just <laughs> the, oh, and I will say the hugging and goodbye of all the crew. No, that was, that totally fell flat. It felt forced. Uh, again, with the lighting in the back, you couldn't really even see them. Um, Colber was there. It was just a little stand in because, um, oh, what's his name? The actor? Come on. Wilson. Wilson, Wilson. Thank you. Wilson Cruz was unavailable. So he was just like a CGI throw in there. I, they could have done it better. I mean, especially when you think about Picard walking in to play poker. I should have done this years ago. Like that, you see individual faces. They're going around, they're doing something that they love. Here, they're just hugging and saying goodbye. What was up with the sound, the track of the laughter going on behind that entire scene? That through, and I'm like, they're not laughing. It's more of like a goodbye. That underline of that laughing, I did not feel was sincere. I didn't feel it was authentic. I did not appreciate that laughter track in the background. Totally misplaced for what I felt the feel of the mood of the room was. Anyone else? Okay. Um, well, okay, Mr. Reitzel, I'm going to bring you in next because we all know you love a good wedding and you love a good romantic romantic story. What, what were your feelings on this closing out? Uh, I thought that wedding outfit for her was pretty cool, uh, but it, 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 we needed more time with it. I think Amy mentioned that as well. We didn't get enough of the, of those together and, and enjoying themselves. Uh, I did want to mention though, and I've, I've said this in a previous episode, I think book is probably the best dressed Star Trek character I've ever seen. Uh, I don't know what it is about his cool coats and his outfit. Even when he's older, he is just killing it. I, I, I loved the, uh, I love uh, David's uh, look and stuff like that. Uh, as for the uh, uh, the ending, um, you know, there was a, a couple of you know nice moments there, especially with Book and Burnham. Uh, but it did feel rushed. You could tell a lot of stuff was done um, when they realized this was going to be last season, and, and and I get that. And you know, um, it's uh, <laughs> after I finished watching this episode, though, I'm going okay. Well. I'm glad they got most of the people together. Um, I think that, um, that Dan was right though earlier that saying that uh, there was a lot of people that they should have brought back, um, and uh, it's sad that we did, it. Uh, and, and learn you know even more about those characters. Uh, but as you know, one of the things if you if you've seen me on podcasting or you've podcasted with, with me before, um, I always judge. TV shows and movies on rewatchability. As you can see behind me, got an extensive uh, uh, collection of TV and movies on physical media, big physical media supporter. And um, as much as I enjoyed moments of characters with Discovery, I don't know if I find myself wanting to go back and revisit this. Uh, I think they did an okay job with uh, wrapping up this series, but I think what I'm going to remember discovering more of is the actors that played them, the moments that fans have had with them, and the fans that do love Discovery of how well Discovery did of representation. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that, uh, that we had many different types of people many types of beliefs uh, sharing moments throughout discovery. And I thought that that was one of the things that uh, discovery will be known for. And I think that's a wonderful place of entertainment history for it, but also launching this new world of star Trek. I wanted so much star Trek after enterprise ended. And um, as much as I wish that maybe we would have had a different story type of telling um, from a different series, uh, I'm glad that Discovery has that moment in history and that because of its popularity that um, and new fans that have come into Star Trek because of it, that we have gotten new series. You know, we've gotten Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, one of my favorites. Just love, love, love Lower Decks and enjoying Prodigy as well. And I'm excited to see what Star Trek television will have in the future because of how Discovery helped launch it. Bill, what about you? How did you feel about the ending, this ending epilogue as a whole and Discovery's place in Star Trek? I felt like it was a little shoehorned in. As as well written and as well done as it was, I felt like 
this is why they had to go back to shoot some additional stuff. Um, I, as it was, it, it could have existed without these, you know, the, these sort of codas and epilogues. Um, you know, if we just got to the end of, you know, shooting the, the, the progenitor tech into the black hole and resolving that story. And at the end of the wedding, we really could have just ended the show and that would have been a fine finale. Um, they did it because they could. And I get that. I mean, it's, it's artistic license, but you know, all things aside, I thought it was, you know, a great solitary moment for Burnham, you know, who entered this ship, a uh, you know, a, a, a prisoner and then wound up being her captain and then eventually taking it to its, its next and potentially final mission as an admiral. I, I thought it was a great um, opportunity for her to sort of, you know, think about where she's been over the last 30 years or so. So um, I think in that sense, it was great. I'm grateful to discovery for what it means for our future. I'm, I'm grateful for everything that it's done in, in its success in helping launch new Trek. Um, like Kevin, I don't know if I'll be rewatching it anytime soon, but at some point I will. Um, I've already seen season one again, and I think it holds up better binging than it does week to week. But I think time will will probably change my feeling on that. You know, initially I didn't want to watch Voyager for a long time, and truthfully, I I had never seen the whole thing until a couple of years ago. So I think as my fandom evolves, my appreciation for Discovery and its finale might evolve too. It's entirely possible. Bailey, what about you? As far as this finale and this kind of epilogue that they did and Discovery's place, the whole and Star Trek. Yeah. So uh, to start off, uh, I'm going to piggyback off what's something that Kevin said. Uh, as we are recording this, it is June. It's it's Pride Month. And so I think it's important to say, you know, Discovery finally brought, yes, we've had hints of it. We had some in TNG where we had characters in an episode, but we had characters in our main cast that are part of that community and they were front and center in a lot of episodes. And I mean, we started out with Stamets and Colbert and their relationship with each other, and then it just blossomed from there. And so I think that bringing that to Trek and bringing it where they can be main characters and we can see them from week to week rather than one-off characters in an episode because they're on some planet. um, I think was absolutely wonderful. And I love that. I I love that part of discovery. I'm also in the same boat. I haven't gone back and rewatched discovery, but again, I probably will at some point, you know, and introduce it. Chloe hasn't necessarily watched it with me. She's seen a few episodes here and there, you know, but she might want to sit down and watch it and I'll watch it with her or, you know, introducing somebody else to Trek and getting them maybe, you know, showing them like, First episode of every series and which one do you think would be the one that you want to watch? Um, which one captured you for right now in this moment? So I think that's wonderful. And I have met people, young people that are new Star Trek fans that started out with Discovery. And because of references and things said, they go back and they watch some of the older stuff. And I think that's just wonderful. It only broadens our community and adds more voices to the discussion and new ideas and new perspectives on things so I think it's wonderful and I love that it's given us this opportunity to have new shows that are going to continue on as well Um, like Amy I also agree I think that the cast that little bit on the ship and it wasn't even like real it was more Burnham was sitting there in the chair and like calling back to maybe something that had happened before is what I felt like it was, it was a callback to when maybe she retired and said, Hey, I'm going to go live my life with book and, and whatnot. So like that, it felt more that way. I would have loved it more if it had been a in the moment type of thing, even if it hadn't been everybody, if it had just been the ones that could come and like, they all sat down and had like a dinner on the ship because that would have felt more appropriate for a send-off for Discovery, this ship that they all loved, that they came together on, and it was them in the current state. I think that would have been more wonderful to see. They could have had more of the cast, you know, and I get it that they filmed what they could, 
But I think that aspect would have been better. And I also didn't like the laugh track either. Um, I think it was it was distracting for sure. As far as Discovery goes in, in my rankings, um, it's not at the very bottom, but it's down towards the bottom because unfortunately, Lower Decks is, is at the bottom for me currently as it stands. Um, it's not my favorite, but Discovery is a few notches up from that right now. Um, I will... It will inevitably change as more shows come out uh, and after I finish Enterprise, which probably won't be too long from now. Um, and I have to throw that into my rankings. So, um, but again, I think this was well done. I get why they wanted to add this coda on. But like you, Bill, I think they could have left it after the wedding when Book and Burnham both tell each other, hey, I love you. And they go off to meet Kovic. I, th- I think that's... Yeah. That's a, those are all fair points there, Haley. Um, Bill, I know you need to teleport out of here sh- shortly. So first of all, thank you for joining us and being part of this great episode. Um, it's a pleasure have, having you here. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I had a great time. Um, despite what everybody thinks listening and watching to this, I, I really do like Discovery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill, before before you go, I just want to say, first of all, um, let people know where they can find you. But also, I wanted to personally thank you for letting us at the... Uh, Fandom Podcast Network, the Highlander Blood of Kings podcast. Yes. Borrow your guys' idea for See It or Skip It. Uh, we did that uh, for all seasons one through five. We didn't do six for obvious reasons, but uh, it was a lot of fun and created some great discussion for See It or Skip It. It was awesome. So thank you. It, it, it's a fun format to play with. And, you know, yeah. even, you know, when, you know, the, the footnote is you'll watch it all anyway because, yeah. you know, it, it's either Highlander or Star Trek and you love it. But um, it, it's a great way to look at these episodes, you know, and uh, I imagine that, you know, with uh, shows going away and no new Star Trek coming for a little bit, uh, we could be going back to that kind of routine. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, again, Bill, thank you so much. Let people know where they can find you and Trek Geeks out there. Yeah, absolutely. You can find uh, Trek Geeks and actually our entire network of shows at trekgeeks.com. Um, or you can go to actually go to trekgeeks.com slash listen to find all of our shows. And uh, actually this coming January, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Trek geeks podcast. So um, congratulations. That's awesome, man. Yeah. We, we, I was at, uh, at the convention this past weekend and, you know, there was a podcasting panel and we were the oldest podcast there. All the other ones were born during the pandemic. And one, I'm thinking, this is so cool. You know, on the other hand, I'm thinking, I am so old. You're so old. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in consolation, we're on year eight here at the Fandom Podcast Network. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, when you awesome. guys get to 10, you'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so for much, coming guys. on, Bill. We really appreciate thank you. you. Thank you for coming, Take for coming Bill. Take care. Okay, guys. Um, Amy, we haven't had a chance to hear from you as far as your putting discovery in its place in star trek history. oh yeah oh goodness <laughs> again <All> right <laughs> yeah okay so i break things into my classic uh and then new and so because classic it just there's no other comparison tng that's it's my show so TNG is always my number one forever and ever. So it's not really fair to compare this new with something that will always be my number one. So that's why I separate it. So from this new era, I think, um, was it Bill or Dan? Or, someone said it best. It was like, I will give them props for launching this amazing new era of Trek. It's it's the story format I, I don't care for. It's, you know, I like watching Star Trek throw on an episode. You just can't do that because the story is an entire season. Now, something that I want to binge, absolutely, Discovery is it. Because when I think about watching, like, TNG, like, an entire season, oh, my gosh, that is just way too much. But if I was like, okay, discovery, yeah, let's let's binge that. I, I'm on board. It's set up to be that way. So I will give it its actual props for launching the actors. Hands down, will be my favorite. They brought us into this new trek. 
The actors are so divine. They have given so much of themselves. So I definitely, um, as far as actors go, they're going to be my favorite crew as far as actors go. Show-wise, um, yeah, I just, the, the shows, there's just better shows. <laughs> All of them. Prodigy, Lower Deaths, <laughs> Strange New World, Picard. Um yeah, so that's where it sits for me. But all the love and respect, I'm telling you, there's no ba- there's no bad Star Trek. It is better than the original series. So I'll, I'll give it that. Ugh. We, we got we got controversy now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did, you see, did you see Haley's face? Did you see yes. Haley's face on the <laughs> <laughs> So you got everybody here spoke so eloquently about the well, the, the epilogue of discovery and I, I i agree with a lot of points that were there i thought maybe it was a little bit too bloated but i think it gave us some great character moments i think that seeing how books relate book and burnham's relationship it finished where it ended up at i think that was great um i i'm with you amy i like the fact that we get a little bit of calypso involved because that calypso is my favorite of the short treks too but i also can understand the points of it um i wonder if the time jump ever happens, if strange new, if the demand for strange new world wasn't so strong. And I, I, so I wonder if that had an effect on us saying we can't have two shows going on in the same timeline. So I did that just throwing that idea out there. But as far as discovery at a whole, I'm going to hit the way back rewind to a podcast that was named Discoville, which <laughs> <laughs> proceeded. Explain the, that Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to do. Um, Discoville was when Discovery first came out, and we wanted to cover Discovery here on the Fandom Podcast Network, but we didn't want to, we felt it deserved its own show. And of course, that's back with Norman Lau was with us, and we came up with Discoville, where we covered the early season of Discovery. Then this thing called the Orville came out, which we all love, and we merged these things together to create now the podcast you're watching, the Union Federation. As far as Discovery and its place in Star Trek history, I think it is very accurate to say that it is definitely going to have a place in Star Trek history because it is the show that ushered in a new era of Star Mm -hmm. Trek. It was a different show than any Star Trek show we had ever seen. And it took chances, whether it's the first season with the look of the Klingons, the fact that the show really did center around one character from start to finish. Eva, you know, you go back to the original series, it wasn't just Kirk. It was Kirk, Spock, McCoy were the heart part of it and then you had all these great supporting characters around it discovery was the michael burnham show and there was great moments with characters at times we wish there would have been more character development but i want to say this and it's the two things i pull out of discovery the absolutely amazing acting ability of sonequa martin green Mm -hmm. sonequa martin green has established herself as one of the greatest captains in star trek history and i i have no no problem saying that this show nailed the relationships i'm even going to say something you thought Haley had a face i have a feeling i might get a face from amy here burnham book is my all-time favorite relationship in star trek and it might be the greatest relationship in star trek history because it's so emotional and so powerful and i i I loved every aspect of that i think discovery opened the doors for a lot of things in this new era and it got people talking about Trek. I remember how excited everybody was when Discovery came out, even behind a paywall, which was something new too. People weren't used to seeing a, a Star Trek show behind a paywall. It changed so much. And that's where Discovery's place in history is going to be. The other thing I'm going to say about this is the best cast family right there was Next Generation. This cast as a family that we see as Star Trek, like I said, it's this and the TNG cast, and it's they're they're close, but there is something very special about this cast, the mutual love they have from each other from top to bottom Mm -hmm. that makes them stand out, and how amazing they have been with a whole new generation of Star Trek fans. And I think that was so key for this show, whether you agree with the show's ups and downs, the cast of this show represented Star Trek with nothing but respect and class mm-hmm. the whole time. So mm-hmm. I think that's where Discovery's place in his final place in history is going to be at. It's the start of a new era. It brought us one of the best captains and be- best character story arcs in Star Trek history. 
the development of Michael Burnham, and I'll even throw in Saru. How those two characters evolved in this series was brilliant, brilliant writing and brilliant performances. And at the end of the day, we're going to see what, what Discovery was responsible for. Strange New Worlds. Opening up a whole new era and timeline, timeline of Star Trek. Let's see what happens now. I don't think we're done seeing members of the Discovery cast on Star Trek things. Obviously, we know mm-hmm. we've got Starfleet Academy with Tilly coming. I'm not going to be surprised if we have some Discovery cam- cameos on that. I could see Sonequa showing up. I could see Paul Stamets showing up. I could see Adira showing up. I mean, there's especially Adira with her relationship with Tilly. But yeah, so Discovery, is that is Discovery's place in history. A new era, fabulous cast, and a wonderful captain. So that that is kind of my thought process on, on that. Haley? Um, I We didn't talk about it. I know I mentioned it. Um, what did you guys think about Rainer's character in this episode? I mean, we were all excited that he finally sat in the chair. Um, but any other thoughts on how he handled things? Because, I mean, he was in charge and they were fighting the brain like nobody's business. So I liked how he reached out, you know, for help and ideas. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought he did a really good job in the captain's chair. And he was my favorite character, uh, new character in this season. And uh, mm-hmm. what I liked about Rainer, too, is that you saw character development from him uh, that, uh, you know, dealing, you know, dealing with a, a new type of leadership that he was not used to. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I really liked uh, um, seeing that side of him. I, I agree. I think Rainer was a brilliant addition to the cast. And I think he was, in this situation, he was the right person to be in the captain's chair in that moment. Because I don't know if Burnham handles that the same way. Hmm. And with the action and with his experience in battle like that, especially against the brain and knowing the brain like he does, it was it was it was very well done. Yeah, I think uh, for me, and I've said this before, like Rainer's, it just so predictable. And in this episode, it he got the job done. I I wasn't moved by him. He did things right, which he should because he's been a captain forever. I, he's a moot point for me. I just. Yeah, predictable, unfortunately. But yeah. great actor. I think he's he's definitely growing on me. The yeah. the the actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we have not seen the last of him in Trek because I would like to see more with that character and see where they. Could yeah, be. yeah. So. But guys, let us transport into away mission. Okay, guys, it is away mission number two, which means it is time to talk. The Ready Room, hosted by Will Wheaton. I confess at the beginning of the show, I have not had yet a chance to watch this, which is very it's frustrating for me because I love Sonequa and I can't wait to watch this interview. But guys, who ha- who here has watched Have the three of you all watched The Ready Room? I have. I have. <laughs> so, so enlighten us on The Ready Room because this had to have been a very powerful episode too because of who we have on here with Sonequa and the Paradise and just every, every everything about it with it being the final episode. Um, <laughs> Kevin? Yeah, let, I just let, want to give a, um, just let you guys know what was covered specifically. Uh, and then we can all kind of uh, touch on each particular topic. So Will Wheaton, of course, had uh, the final episode, uh, had Sonequa Martin Green on there, uh, Michael Burnham, and executive producer and sh- co showrunner Michelle Paradise. Uh, and they were both on in the room with uh, being interviewed by Will, not by camera or anything like that. So it was great to see them interact in the room together. Uh, you also had a topic of them t- touching on the stunts in this episode as well. And then we also had a really nice, um, um, I guess you could say, tribute to Sonequa Martin-Green and her place in uh, Star Trek history with a wonderful surprise by videos from Sir Patrick Stewart talking um, uh, with Sonequa. And she was surprised by this. She did not know this was happening. Also, uh, Michelle Hurd from Star Trek Picard, and then also uh, Jonathan Frakes were all in a video talking about 
working either working with Sonequa or her impact on Star Trek. And I'm not going to tease, uh, I'm not going to spoil what that is because I want to give everyone else who has seen it a chance to give their expressions and their um, feelings on this. And then I'll go into that later. But I just want to let the listeners and the watchers on YouTube know what the main parts of were covered on this really good episode of The Radio. So, Amy, start with you. What were your feelings on this episode and what they covered? I really, before I get too gushy about Sonequa Martin-Green, because I am just going to lay it all out there, but they had a great, like, behind the scenes. You know how we always love that, and you see the cameras, and they're they're explaining how they had heated water and these winds so that, you know, to do that rain and, like, all the worlds and how the worlds like popped up out, you know, into the trees popping up and the fire and the volcanoes and the mountaintop. Like it was so well explained, like this infinity tunnel, I think is what they called it uh, when they were inside the vortex or whatever it was. It again, behind the scenes, my super favorite part. That's why I love the ready room. But my goodness, Sonequa Martin-Green literally is my favorite human being on this planet. I am so impressed with how she manages to be so humble, so grateful. She lives in gratitude and yet accepts her ownership of actions of making being this amazing star and lead role and example to us all. Like she gives flowers, she accepts flowers. She's always so gracious and willing to accept other contributions into her life. Um, And you can tell by the, the video comments, she is an exceptional human being. Like, how can we get more of her? I want to, she definitely is inspirational to me. I feel that I have changed and become a better person because of her amazing example. And like hearing the people talk about her, you know, Jonathan Frakes, of course, Star Trek has tons of amazing people working, but for her to stand out head and shoulders, like, She is an exceptional person, and we are very, very blessed to have her in our Star Trek fandom. So I will leave it at that. Kevin. Uh, My favorite moment was when, um, and Will does a great job interviewing people, especially when he gets a chance to do it in person, Uh, especially when he opens up the uh, the episode. and, And instead of him saying it's, you know, you know, either time to warp or whatever. He lets Sonequa set, you know, do her thing saying, oh, what, what does Sonequa like to say in charge? Does she do? Let's, let's fly. fly. Let's fly. Yeah. 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 So that was really cool how they started off the show. But when he introduces, like we have some people that want to uh, say something to you mm-hmm. and you see her turn her head and look up at the monitor and Sir Patrick Stewart is there mm-hmm. and she, her mouth is open going, oh my God, what is happening here? And he gives a wonderful, um, uh, um, a wonderful moment, gives a wonderful moment to her about um, how, you know, as a captain, how she's able to do it. And then, um, you know, then you have Michelle Hurd. Uh, that was my favorite part because the mm-hmm. camera kept going from what Michelle Hurd was saying about her uh, moment in Star Trek history, which I'll get to in a second, but you start to see her uh, Sonequa's eyes well up with water and tears of happiness and, and just can't believe what's going on right now. And then you slowly start to see a tear come down her face throughout this wonderful video uh, that she's seeing. But to me, and, and I was tearing up while I was watching this. And, and this is the emotional thing that I was really, really getting into that I didn't get for, you know, the season finale or the series finale of, uh, of, uh, discovery, but I'm glad that I got it from this moment with Sonequa because I want to echo the things that you were saying about Sonequa. Um, Amy is that she seems like such a wonderful and humble person. And when Michelle Hurd starts talking about how, when her father or her family was saying, I want you to watch this original star Trek, this is or her. And she says, I got to see 
these me and my siblings, brown siblings, watching what this person did for Star Trek. And now you as a captain. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that you get to be a captain and it's okay, and you get to be another I, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but mentioning the impact that Sneakwa has as an African American woman heading a show as a captain and what it meant to Michelle Hurd. And you see almost Michelle Hurd breaking down as she's saying this. And then you go over, you see the camera go over to Sneakwa and you could just see tears falling in, <laughs> into her lap. It was a really wonderful moment, not just for Star Trek history, but just human being, being mm-hmm. one, one human being being wonderful to another person. It, it was very inspiring. Mm-hmm. Ailey? Yeah, I have to echo, you know, what what Amy and Kevin have said. Uh, I remember being at STLV when the cast came to, it was their first time coming to a convention and getting to hear their experiences of, of joining in this fandom and in this large family, essentially, um, but being family as a cast and um, just hearing her talk at, at, you know, different conventions as I watched videos of it and hearing other people have their interactions with her. She really is just a truly wonderful human being. And so it's wonderful that we've had this experience to have her as a captain. I know we on this show have talked about, okay, we've kind of got burnout where she's always got to be the person in rescue and it's usually just her figuring it out. Um, But as a person herself, Sonequa really is a remarkable human. And I was, I love how surprised she was with those little videos because it was just so unexpected Mm -hmm. for her. And I really, truly love that. I think this was a nice conversation to wrap up like the show in itself and, and saying goodbye to these characters. So. One other thing, I just, we've talked so much about Sonequa Martin-Green, but Michelle Paradise was amazing. And I loved getting the backstory of like, when they started thinking about using the chase out of mm-hmm. all episodes, you know, that it was yeah. actually back with season four uh, with the species 10 C and they were trying to throw that in there, but it just didn't fit. And so then we have this season five. So, and again, Michelle paradise is great. And uh, I really like her as a executive producer and showrunner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like wanna, how she mentioned this Indiana Jones, yeah, you know, type shenanigans that you know Will Wheaton was asking about. Like, why did you, why did you go to this episode of all the things? Like, yeah. it's so weird. Yeah. I was like, yeah. it really was kind of weird. Yeah, it's just all out, out this yeah. out of everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just want to weigh in real quick. I haven't watched the episode yet, but I do want to weigh in on Sneakle Martin Green. Mm-hmm. I spoke a lot when I talked about her police service. I've been a fan of Sneakle Martin Green from way back when she was on The Walking Dead. And that I feel like I kind of watched her grow up from her because that was kind of her break was The Walking Dead. And I was I remember being so disappointed when they wrote her character out of the show and then finding out she's the lead in the new Star Trek show. I'm like, oh, this is that that made my anticipation for Discovery even that much higher because I was already a fan of Sneaker. And if you even talk to people before Trek when she would show up at conventions for Walking Dead, you would hear how an amazing person she was and how kind she was to the fans and how great she was with the fans and she's just gone up to another stratosphere over her time in the star trek family and you can tell how much she appreciates it how much she is humbled by the experience of it but how much she knows what it's about and the dignity she carries with it and the responsibility she has being not only the representative for star trek as a captain in star trek but to being an a African American female in in Star Trek in this position, and she is so eloquent. She is so intelligent. She is so well spoken, and the, she's just kind. And that says so much. And if we are, if she is to be, when it's all said and done, I, as William Shatner gets older, Patrick Stewart is getting older, the next gen cast as a whole getting older. Older. If she is to become kind of the face representation of Star Trek, along with right now maybe with Anson Mount but what a great person to be able to say this is our ambassador for Star Trek for the next 30 to 50 years i mean just we they got so lucky and we are as Star Trek fans so lucky to have somebody 
this great in that position. And I cannot wait to see what she does next. And I think her return to Trek, because I think she will return to Trek at some point in, in one capacity or another. I think she is too popular and too important not to. So I am very excited for that. Um, any other final thoughts on this week's Ready Room? Anybody? Oh, it's good. We I think we covered the the, mm-hmm. the gamut of it. Oh, okay. That was a good one. Well, let's definitely worth it. Let's inter- let's intercept some subspace sequels and get this show wrapped up. Okay, so subspace signals normally means the orb of prophecy, except we don't have any more discovery to talk about. However, we did get some breaking news just the other day. Star Trek Prodigy season two, of course. Not on Paramount Plus, on Netflix. But not only is Star Trek season Prodigy season two coming out, which we never thought we for a while there we didn't think we were actually going to get. But Netflix is dropping the entire season on July first. All twenty episodes of season two. You said Netflix, right? <laughs> That's going to be weird. <laughs> yeah, that, that is going to be weird. Um, I'm excited. I love season one of Prodigy. It's so different from anything else that Star is done in Star Trek. And I'm really excited to see that you're going to get a chance to at least wrap it up. If this is the final season, at least wrap it up on a, on a note and get, get the story of these characters. Because I, I fell in love with these characters. And Kevin, I know you still are in that search of that stuff, Murph. Yeah, I need a Murph still. Yeah. <laughs> So we and of course we will be covering. We haven't quite figured out the schedule yet, but we will be covering all things Star Trek Prodigy season two when it hits, and we'll get kind of get our schedule figured out and go from there. We weren't expecting all the episodes to drop at once. Thank you, Netflix. Do we want to tease what else we're going to be doing? Oh wait, wait, wait! But hold on. Um, there's been a little confusion for our Canadian fans yeah, that it kidding. hasn't come out with Netflix quite yet. So yeah, as of what I read today, they're not getting it in Canada. Oh, why? Why? This is an international world. Come on now. I think we talked about this last time. Like, I know it doesn't yeah. make any sense why some people get it at a certain point. Like, it's all the same. Yeah. Netflix is Netflix. Yeah. Like, come right. on now. I know Get your, like together it's yeah. it's crazy because like I'm watching Korean shows on Netflix like they yeah. are literally international um I'm hoping it's not the last season because we did get some news that Skydance mm-hmm. Skydance is, is buying Paramount yes so <laughs> I'm hoping with Skydance having a lovely relationship with Star Trek that maybe they'll bring back Prodigy and continue it because I think it is a big success. I mean, we had a huge fan-saving event, sort of. I don't know. I feel like the fans really supported Prodigy. So yeah. I, I that's my wish that, uh, you know, now that Skydance is involved, we might see a season three. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. So, uh, Kyle looks like he might have just uh, jumped out for a little minute here. We'll go ahead and uh, wait till he gets reconnected there. Uh, I did want to mention uh, we do are working on another thing. We're going to be returning back to Star Trek The Next Generation in a limited mm. uh, podcast. What we're going to be doing is uh, one of the things that Star Trek The Next Generation did really, really well was doing two-part episodes. So we are actually going to go back and um, uh, spend uh, uh, time at those great two-part episodes, several of them, which, of course, were uh, season um, cliffhangers. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be talking about the eight different two-part episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. And then we're going to rank them because I found a great article that does that. And uh, we're also going to talk about the cultural impact that these two parters had, and uh, our own our own stories looking back in our Star Trek history when we first watched these two part episodes live. So yeah, I mean we can all agree there was the worst summer ever. So let's just put that <laughs> yeah. on the table. Yeah. We will right be talking now. about that. Yes, <laughs> I, got, worst I got intercepted by some Marine ever. real quick. There, I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> Kyle's back. Kyle's back. Yep. Yeah. Um. With that, guys, I'm look. I'm looking forward to what we're going to do with those two part episodes too. Um, 
But with that, guys, it is this has been the Union Federation podcast. Um, I feel a little sad. I feel like we're closing a chapter in some ways because we wouldn't have this podcast without the creation of Star Trek Discovery. So mm-hmm. this, this is a little bit sad, but we've got plenty of great things to talk about. Still, there's plenty of things coming up in Star Trek. We're going to be revisiting not only two part episodes. We are going to get back to doing some things with the Orville too. We're just trying to figure out the right things and we're just waiting on news. Just keep these, these persistent rumors. <laughs> we just want confirmation, Seth, one way or the other. Quit leaving us hanging. But hopefully you have been enjoying this episode of the Union Federation podcast, whether you're watching it on the Phantom Podcast Network YouTube channel or listening to it on the feeds of either the Phantom Podcast Network or the BQN. Of course, you can find the Phantom Podcast Network at fpnet.podbean.com or on all of your major podcast catchers. I am Kyle, the been the ship's captain for this wonderful episode with an amazing crew. My thanks to Dan and Bill from Trek Geeks for joining us. They, they, it was a lot of fun. Um, yes. Kevin, where, where can people find you on social media? Uh, you can find me on uh, X, Instagram, Thread, Letterboxd, Discord, all at Spartan underscore Phoenix. And Haley, where can people find you? You can find me on Blue Sky and Twitter on instagram uh at trekkie zero one d isn't it nice kevin when you can like nag the same one on all of them yeah. so awesome <laughs> just saying yeah. and, and amy there's this it's just assimilating <laughs> the audio what, what, what's going on with bqn hey come on over to bqn we've got a lot of fun podcasts going on going on over there i myself am co-host of all good things uh, where we talk about all of Star Trek. So it's really a good time over there. I am on Discord at Amy Nelson 522 Also Instagram. I couldn't get the same one on Twitter, but I'm not really there anymore. So Discord really is my new favorite place. Uh, so you can find me there. And in our I'm Facebook on- group. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I am Kyle. You can find me on Twitter and at AKyleW. You can also find me on Discord at AKyleW. You can find me on Instagram and threads at Akyle Fandom. Um, and of course, you can find the Fandom Podcast Network on our Facebook page. BQN has a wonderful pay- Facebook page. And of course, this is the Fandom Podcast Network YouTube channel. Please give us a like, give us a subscribe, share us out. We're always trying to grow the channel. Um, it has been a fun ride for this final season of Discovery. I can't believe we are actually done with Discovery yet. It seems like a long time. And yet it seems like it's been a fast, fast time too. Um, my thanks to the wonderful crew of the union federation. You guys are the ones that make this happen. I, I just, you know, I've just been lucky enough to fly along in the captain's chair and rub the knob every, every <laughs> week while <been> covering, <laughs> covering Star Trek discovery. Um, we, you heard what we've got coming up. We're, we're working on other things as well. Um, you might even, delve a little outside of the Star Trek universe, but it will be Star Trek related. I got to talk with Nelson about, um, you know, um, something to do for all mankind, but we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But for now, thank you guys to this amazing crew. Thank you to our wonderful listeners out there. We do this for you and you make it worthwhile. Um, until next time, hailing frequencies are now closed. <laughs> <laughs>